Oh, great. If you turn back to Mark chapter 3, just looking at this last few verses of the chapter. <clears throat> There's no doubt that the scriptures hold the family unit in very high regards. They spend a significant uh, time giving clear guidance on how the family functions in a way that honors God, whether that's in the way that a husband and wife interact with each other or the relationship between the parents and the children, or indeed, of course, the attitudes and responses that children are to have towards their parents. In the time of Jesus, the people of God saw themselves not so much as individuals scattered around the, the nation, but as family units working together, encouraging and strengthening each other along life's path. And that meant that they lived together in extended households. You know, if someone got married in the house, they'd build an extension and then an extension, they'd just keep adding on because they wanted to be this family unit. They cared for elderly family members. They would not um, put them away somewhere. They took care of relatives' orphans and relatives' widows and widowers. They, they drew them in. And there's so much for us to learn off that as a culture, isn't there? And that attitude that was really formed by the law of God became a really inherent part of the way they functioned as a culture. It was family units working together in the fields, striving together for the honor of God. And Jesus himself makes it very clear about how highly he thinks about such family units. Um, he rebukes those who, makes, who make excuses concerning financial aid for increasingly elderly parents. He rebukes the growing practice of allowing divorce for any reason. And even as he's dying on the cross, you remember some of his words as he speaks to that disciple and says, to care for his mother. And what are we going to say in, as you take your dying breath as the God and Savior of the world? Take care of my family. And yet, despite all of the significance of the family unit within Scripture, the whole of Scripture and Jesus himself put boundaries on the place of the family in a person's life. They, they say, look, the family unit is very important, yes, but, and there's always a but, but the family is not to be all defining. It's not to be all encompassing. It's not to have this God-like controlling power in your life because it is God you worship and not your children and not your parents, not your family units. Or we could put it another way and say that there are other calls on a person's life that take precedence even over the highest calling of our lives within our families. This is the reality that is expressed in these few verses, and it's expressed in some of the most stark and shocking ways that Jesus uh, speaks so this morning, we have three aspects to consider concerning the family from this incident. The first is the call of the family. The second is the limits upon the family. And then the third thing we'll consider is that there is only one true and ultimate family. So first of all, the call of the family. Here we encounter Jesus Christ. He's the Son of God. He's God incarnate into the world. And he's interacting with his earthly family. While being truly and fully God, he is also truly and fully man. Born of a woman. Born under the law. And so he now lives on earth in such a way as to obey the law of God given on Sinai. To express that in its right way, in its right context, and with the right limits within his own earthly family. We have, of course, very little knowledge of the interactions between Jesus growing up as a boy and his, this relationship with his family and his parents. But we do get one insight, don't we, at the age of 12, where in Luke chapter 2, his family are returning home after attending the Passover festival in, in uh, Jerusalem. 
And they were all traveling back home in their big caravans, not I say caravans, you know the old word for caravan, whatever it is, walking through with their ho- horses and, and so on. And they're going home. And they get a couple of days' journey in, and they realize that Jesus isn't with them because maybe he's with the wider family. That's the way their families functioned back then. And so they return to Jerusalem. They search around Jerusalem. It's not until the third day that they find him in the temple. I don't know what he did for food or sleep in those three days, but there he is in the temple, and he's discussing scriptures with the leaders of the temple. And they're frustrated, they're angry, they're upset. And this is what happens. When they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he didn't say to them, oh, I'm sorry, I've disobeyed the law there. No, he says, why, why did you seek me? Here's a 12-year-old boy saying to his parents, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? From an early age, while he obeys them, he also has this larger priority. And that is to obey the God of heaven, his father, to do his business. But we're told in the next verse in Luke chapter 2, but they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. And here we are in Mark chapter 3, 18 years later, and it's clear that his family still don't understand this statement. It must be about my father's business. They don't understand still his priorities. His family are again seeking him anxiously, aren't they? Just like all of those years ago. And again, their attitude is, why are you doing this to us? You're making us anxious. You're frustrating us. You're not working within the limits of the family. And here he is doing the same thing as he did 18 years before, teaching about the kingdom, discussing the scriptures, making disciples, challenging the traditional Jewish teachings. And that, of course, as we've been seeing over the last few weeks, has been severely winding up the teachers of the law. The family realized that the whole family reputation is just dropping through the floor the more he speaks and the more he interacts with people. And so his family issue him with a call. Come back home, son. It's time to stop this nonsense. They give their reasoning in verse 21. He is out of his mind. We've been seeing over recent weeks how Jesus Christ has been himself issuing calls to fishermen, Tax collectors, come and follow me. Be my disciples. Go where I go. Obey my call. But here is a counter call to him. A family call. A mother's call. Come and follow me, son. Leave what you're doing. Come back to your family. Come back to the safety of your home. Come away from your insanity. Come and let's restore the family reputation together. What they'd failed to understand was that he was still about his father's business. And his father's business was that he was to be the Messiah, Savior of the world. And he can't be distracted from that. You see, calling people to himself, Jesus was not being insane as they thought he was. No, he was calling people out of insanity back to the sanity of life as God had created it to be. To be united with God once more, to follow in his ways, to obey his word. This is sanity. But in issuing her call to to him, Mary is unknowingly calling him to insanity. Towards disobeying the very one who governed the universe with the word of his power the one who's upholding all things, the one who created the universe and sent his son out on this great rescue mission of souls. Her call was a call to insanity when she thought it was a call away from insanity. But the big question is, was he right in not responding to her call? 
because the law clearly said that he was to obey his parents, to honor them. The law of God demanded that a child from their heart obeyed and honored their parents in whatever they said. And Jesus' family could so easily point to that law and urge him at this point, you can't speak to us like that. The law of God says you are to obey and honor your parents. You see, at the heart of the law of God was love, wasn't it? Love of God and love of your neighbor. And the command to obey and honor your parents is a call of love. Call of love. If you love your parents, you will obey them, you will honor them. The irony here, though, is that if he here obeys her command, he's doing the very opposite to loving her. In fact, if he obeys her, he is hating her, he is despising her. Why? Because she is calling him away from getting into trouble with the religious leaders of the day. But it's by getting into trouble with them that leads him down the path to the cross, to salvation, to payment for her sins, to forgiveness, to reconciliation with God. This is the path he is treading. He is deliberately putting himself into this position where the the leaders get so angry that they plot to kill him, as we saw a couple of weeks back. It's this troubled path that is going to save her and his brothers. And so it would be the ultimate dishonor, an act of unsurpassed hatred for him to obey her call rather than be about his father's business. Because in obeying her call, there is no salvation for her, his brothers, or any of us this morning. And though she didn't realize it, her call for him to follow her was simultaneously a call for him to disobey God and not to do his father's work. What was his father's work? What's his father's will? Well, later in John chapter 6, Jesus would tell us. Jesus says there, this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up on the last day. This is the will of the father that he is, his business is in this world, to lose no one that his father has predestined from before the foundation of the world. Her call was a call for him to regain the family reputation. But at the same time, it was an unwitting call to lose the people that his father had given him. And that included Mary. And that included his brothers. And that includes all of us who know and love the Lord Jesus. Ultimately, it comes down to this. As we've been seeing through Mark 3, the family call here is a demonic one. It's an evil one. It's a hellish call. Subtle and clever as it is, using the very law of God against the obedient son in order to destroy the world and send us all to hell. And this is why the limits placed on the family by Scripture and here by Jesus are so very important. As we see secondly, the limits on the family. The law of God to obey our fathers and mothers has its limits. But it's almost invariably not where the child puts them, right? I know, I remember growing up a very long time ago, but I still remember it. And I thought I should obey my parents when they did what I asked or commanded or demanded in the way and in the time that I demanded it. My limits on family obedience was my own will. And in that, I was being sinful. I was law-breaking. Because the limits put on the family is not the child's will, but the father's will. And here Jesus marks out the limits in the right place. And that limit, according to this passage, is when obedience to parents comes in clear and direct conflict to the will of God. 
It's the same with governments, it's the same with everybody in position of authority. If they call us to destroy the work of God, then there must be a limit to our obedience to all in authority. To the call of his family, this is what he answers. He answers with a question, who are my mother and my brothers? And then he points to his followers and he says, no, this is my family, the church. This is my family, those who do the will of God. And to those listening that day, his response must have been shocking. This is a a profoundly dismissive attitude towards his mother's call. He doesn't even go out to side to, to reason or to chat through it or to say this is the reason why. He just says, who are my mother and brothers? And then he carries on with his work. The point he is making so forcefully is that there are times when God's will and God's family come into direct conflict with our will and our family's will. And here is one very clear unbreakable limit on the demands of the family. Not only for Christ here, but for each one of us. If our families call us to deny Christ, that we give up on following God's will and instead conform to the desires of the family, the tension between the family and Christ has passed breaking point. Um, Just a year or so ago, I can't remember, maybe two years now or a year and a half, we had on this platform a a Muslim giving his testimony of how he'd become a Christian and he's talking through the process of what had convinced him that Jesus Christ was the Lord and Savior of the world. And if you remember, he pointed out that it was the ba- his baptism that was the crux point of division between him and his family. And he knew that if he was to be baptized, to de- publicly declare that he was no longer a Muslim but a Christian, that would be the breaking point and he would lose his family. He had to make that choice. And in that moment, Do I obey my parents or do I obey the living God? So I have to go with Christ. I have to. Even if I lose everything in this world that I love and hold dear, I must follow Christ. And he did. And his family turned up to the baptism and were all converted. But that doesn't often happen. Very often what happens is when someone is baptized, The family will say, you're out. You're no longer my son. You don't belong to this family anymore. You've lost us forever. And yet this is the call of Christ. To say, he's my savior. He's bled and died upon a cross for me. He is my only hope in life and death. There is no other salvation. Do I I take my family for this life? but then lose them in the next anyway? Or do I follow the Lord Jesus Christ and say like Christ, who is my mother? Who's my father? Who's my brothers? As Jesus later shockingly again says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, cannot be my disciple. You can't get more stark than that. For Jesus is saying that our love for Jesus Christ must be so high, so exalted, so lifted up beyond any other loves that in comparison, our great love for our families is counted in comparison as hatred. Such a wide gulf. Jesus Christ is so exalted in my life that people look at me and say, He hates his family in comparison with his love for Christ. This is what it means to take up our cross, says Jesus there, and follow Jesus in our home life. We live, again, in a culture that idolizes the family, often above and beyond everything else. 
And it's not only the children that have to make these tough choices about what is God's will and what is my family's will. As parents, too, we live in this tension and we have to decide our priorities for our own children. How do I lead them to see the will of God and how much more important Christ is even than me as a father or a mother? It's a great tension, isn't it? Are we showing our children that God comes first in all things? Or are we so exalting the world's treasures and pleasures to such heights that Christ merely feels like one God among many? Do they see in us that following Christ is not just a priority, but that it's everything? He is everything. He is more than life to me, as the hymn says. He's the, he's the great delight of my heart. He's the joy of my lips. He's what I love to speak about. As Deuteronomy 6 says, when we're just walking together with our families, let's oh, look at this creation. Isn't it beautiful? What a wonderful Savior. He created such things drawing our families constantly to think about the reality of God, the love of God, the mercy of Christ. But Jesus is not just the first among equals, but in comparison to him. All the greatest joys and treasures and pleasures of life are but rubbish. Isn't that what Jesus, uh, isn't that what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 3? I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him. What are the things that our children need to see as rotting rubbish in comparison to the beauties of Christ? Good though they may be on so many levels, yet when they replace Christ, they've taken on a sinful status in our home life. We have a call of the world, we have the call of families, but we've got this call of Christ. And when the two come into conflict, where will we land? Joined to Christ as we are, his priorities must become ours too. And where we say, ah, we must be about the Father's business. We serve our family best when Christ is seen as all in all to us. When there are limits placed on the family pleasures and pastimes in order to say, Jesus is much better than those. He's glorious. He's beautiful. He's wonderful. Everything else is just rubbish in comparison with him. This is what we see here with the Lord Jesus. His denial of following their will and their wisdom ultimately leads to their salvation. It's right when we say in the conflict, in the clash of family versus Christ, I follow Christ, that might seem to demean our families and their joys, but in the end it leads to their salvation. I love the post-ascension account in Acts chapter 1, where I remember Christ has ascended, the disciples are all gathered in the upper room, and they're all praying. What do we see there? Verse 14, Acts 1, we read, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. They're all converted. Even though he treated them this way and said, who are my mother and brothers? Here they are now, his very denial of their call His very limits that he puts on his family lead to their salvation. This would never have happened if Jesus had done what they had said. How much wisdom we require and how much prayer to lead our families in such a way that they often won't get what they want, but they will get what they need. Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. The limits on the family is where true freedom is found. I heard an illustration recently about the freedom of the fish is found within the boundaries of the water. 
If the fish jumps out of the water onto the land, he says, I'm free, and then he dies. <laughs> it's within the boundaries that God has set for each one of us that true freedom is found. And it's when, when we set the limits on our family and say, it's God's will that we are doing. It is Christ that is to be honored. It is within those boundaries where true freedom is to be discovered. But then thirdly and finally here, Jesus reveals that he is establishing a true and ultimate family. Verse 33 to 35. He answers them saying, who is my brother? Who is my mother or my brothers? And he looked around in a circle at those who sat about him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister. I love the diff different definitions that Mark has of, and Christ through Mark has, of Christians, of disciples, of followers of Jesus. Sometimes it's a, a kind of a national figure, isn't it? Jesus is king and we are the subject. But here, it's beautiful, isn't it? God's people, Christ's people are his brothers, his sisters, mothers, we're part of a warm and loving family when we come to follow Christ. A family where our brother Jesus gave himself up for our redemption, shed his own blood that the family who do the will of God might be safe, saved, forgiven, washed, reconciled with God. I love the way to Hebrews points out that we will never be perfect brothers and sisters of Christ like he was but he's still not ashamed of us. He's not ashamed of us. He never withdraws or separates from this family. He never says to us, who are they? He says, I am yours, I'm your brother, your savior brother. And in this family, lost children, lost in the dark night of sin, lost, long lost children become adopted into the family of God. We are joined eternally with him, declared to be children of God. We can call him God Father. The Gospel of Mark was written to early Christians who were literally losing their lives, losing their homes losing their national status, being beaten and sent away from their homes and from their families for the sake of the gospel. And Mark is writing to them in the early church. And what comfort this would have brought them, as wherever they went, they knew, I'm still part of a family, a family that cannot be divided by space or time. Jesus is my brother in heaven. And wherever I go, I can meet brothers and sisters in him. And what good news this is for us also. For in giving up everything to follow Christ, we find a warm welcome into a new family, even if it means we've lost everybody else in the world, all our friends, all our family, our mothers, brothers, fathers, sisters, we lose everybody, uncles, aunts, grandparents, we lose them all by following Christ, but we're welcomed into a new family, the church, the people of God. How are we doing as a church in this regard? How are we acting as family? How are we being family, brothers and sisters to one another? Do we see one another as a family unit with God as our father, bound together by the spirit, loving each other as our brother Christ has loved us? Is that the attitudes, the dimension that we have as we gather together, I'm going to see my family, see my brothers and sisters, my mothers, my fathers, my children. Church life ought to be defined by these family attitudes. It's a massive part of the description of the church in scripture. And as such, must be a welcome sight for the orphan who needs a mother and father. 
the single mother who desires tender companionship in the trials of parenting, for the widow and the widower who've outlived their life, love, partner, for the family unit who are looking for a larger vision on life than just within the four walls of their own house. Here in the church, we find new fathers, new mothers, new brothers, new sisters, new children, who we can learn from and whom we can love. Well, as one writer puts it, when he speaks about Mark 3, this is where he says, he says, if we are selfishly looking for how to make our nuclear families happier and more secure, we will not find much here. But if we are looking for God's grander purpose for the family, we will find good news, particularly for those who, for whatever reasons, are alone and without family. May, as a church, we increasingly obtain this grand vision of Christ and see one another as it's more than passes by on a Sunday morning, which we don't, but see each other as true family in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Well, we're going to listen to a song.